So in addition to envelopes, viruses can also carry enzymes with them. And as I mentioned, many viruses are bound by this flexible membranous layer called the envelope. What's cool is that the envelope um, is taken from the host cell. So the virus has to put its own unique spikes or receptor proteins in it. And so it'll often poke these little spikes through the membrane. And as I also mentioned in the title there, enzymes can be associated with the envelope or capsid. Some of the um, combinations of viral genomes are pretty impressive. So uh, a virus can have a single or double-stranded DNA or RNA genome. So the SARS-CoV-2 virus, for example, has a single-stranded RNA genome, whereas, say, chickenpox has a, the chickenpox virus has a double-stranded DNA genome. So it can be a wide variety. You and I have a double-stranded DNA genome, for example. The size varies from virus to virus, so SARS-CoV-2 is a very big genome, <laughs> about 30,000 nucleotides, and the genomes can be in different com configurations. They can be linear or circular. And so that's sort of highlighted in this table. So DNA um, viruses that are single-stranded, they can have linear single-stranded DNA or si circular single-stranded DNA. And here's some examples of that. Parvoviruses often, um, you know, they can cause infections in puppies and things and you know cuz and, and so they're you know, there's a they could also cause they're also human parvoviruses but they um, can also be double stranded so again typically linear double stranded dna and so that's the herpes viruses such as um, the virus that causes um, chickenpox or you know herpes simplexes that cause you know, genital herpes and things like that so there's a lot of double stranded viruses as well and so here's an example of a linear, the way it would be arranged, almost like a ladder, or a double-stranded DNA with cross-linked ends. You see the cross-linked ends. RNA viruses are also very um, <clears throat> highly prevalent, and so these guys can be single-stranded, so they can be have a linear, single-stranded, positive-strand RNA genome. And by that, we, we mean um, that the RNA can actually um, be used to make proteins directly by ribosomes. Some viruses are linear, single-stranded, neg negative-strand RNA viruses. And so a negative strand has to be converted to a positive strand in the host cell. And then the positive strand can be used to make protein. So SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19, falls into this category as a um, linear, single-stranded positive stranded RNA virus, but so, so do many others, like the polio viruses and the rhinoviruses that cause common colds. Um, <clears throat> but linear single stranded negative strand RNA viruses are like the rabies viruses and so forth, measles and mumps. Some of these guys are linear single stranded segmented positive strand RNA viruses, and so that means that their genomes are in pieces, small pieces. So we know that, um, <clears throat> we know that there's a, you know, Influenza viruses, for example, have linear, single-stranded, segmented, negative-strand RNA genomes. So again, a variety of, of, of nucleic acid types, structures, and here's some virus examples in this particular comprehensive table. So here's a generalized illustration of virus reproduction. And I'll, I'll in the next lecture, where I talk more about um, SARS-CoV-2 specifically, I'll give you a, I'll show you a, the, um, a more detailed look at this. But this generalized illustration just shows you um, influenza virus binding to a host cell. Here's the nucleus. And so the, the virus comes in and the vesicle will uncoat and inject its genetic information into the cytoplasm that you see here. The genetic information can move into the host nucleus where it's, um, where it's further replicated and eventually the, um, <clears throat> the um, messenger RNA fragments can come back out and encode um, or be translated into proteins. So that's viral contents are released, viral RNA enters the nucleus where it is replicated by the viral RNA polymerase. So viral mRNA is used to make the proteins. So the mRNA that gets made here gets pumped out into the um, cytoplasm, and then ribosomes can glob onto them and, and allows that to make proteins. And those proteins in, uh, include the, the various features of the virus to make new viruses, and then eventually the virus will bud out of the cell. 
And the cell isn't ne necessarily killed during this process, but it does get taken over and become a virus factory. <laughs> so some of the suitable hosts um, for um, viruses include you know, host animals. So we can often use guinea pigs, for example, or mice. Often we use embryonated eggs. <clears throat> So, um, you know, again, you have like a little carton of eggs and you cut a little hole in the top of the egg and you can inject um, virus preparations into that and the viruses will then grow in that tissue and then you can pull the viruses out of the, uh, of the um, embryonated egg tissue. Probably the easiest way to work with viruses is in tissue culture or cell culture. And this is what we would have done in the lab working with uh, um, vir bacterial viruses and, and bacterial cell cultures. So we can use monolayers of animal cells that are, you know, propagated from an individual. Usually they're like, you know, cancer cells or something that you can get from an in, from somebody, and then you can grow them forever in culture. Um, similarly, we can use bacterial virus bacterial cells to grow um, bacterial viruses. And what we're looking for is certain cytopathic effects, microscopic or macroscopic changes or abnormalities in those particular cells. So. Um, with, with bacterial and archaeal uh, viruses, we can usually cultivate them in broth or ag agricultures, and as long as the bacteria are actively growing. If the bacteria are not actively growing, then the virus can't actively grow, right? Because the virus needs an actively growing bacterium with, you know, all of its uh, machinery working. Um, and one way, to, one, one cytopathic effect we can see if we have a turbid or cloudy broth culture of bacteria and we put a virus in there knowing that the viruses cause lysis of the cells they'll they should this the culture should lose turbidity as the virus reproduces and on solid media we can see plaques that occur and so that looks which are which are basically um, areas of localized cell destruction and lysis so that was that's what's pictured here in this pretty simple assay you you um, you have a, um, a tube of semi-solid molten auger containing your host, your host bacteria and your virus preparation. And you pour that into a plate and it solidifies. And then wherever there are viruses deposited, the virus will cause a localized infection and radiate outward and kill all the cells in that area. And so you see these really pronounced what are called plaques. <clears throat> And so then we can count these plaques in the same way we count colonies and get an estimate of virus concentration in a preparation. So some of the virus assays then um, used to quantify viruses, you know, we can do a direct approach where we, where we directly look at the viruses under the microscope and then count them. So here's some viruses scattered around under the electron microscope and then we can do counts. If we know, if I know that I put one microliter drop in this area, I can then count the number of viruses that are physically within that one microliter drop. Um, but an indirect approach is measuring some kind of cytopathic effect. And again, that, that's the, um, um, you know, for example, measure, counting plaques. Each plaque is theoretically where a single virus was, de was deposited. So if I, in my original tube over here that I mentioned, if I had put one milliliter of a unknown concentration virus preparation there and poured that onto these plates, then I can count the number of plaques on this and, and use that. So imagine there's 25 plaques here. That would be 25 viruses per mil if, I, if, if my original tube can't contain a mil of virus preparation. So the um, oops. <laughs> so anyway, that's what's that's what's indicated here. So your dilution of virus preparation made and plated on a line of host cells, and the number of plaques can be counted, and the results are then exp expressed as PFU for plaque forming units. And by this way, in in this type, using these types of assays, we can determine infectious dose and lethal dose of a particular virus. So in either case, it's deter you're determining the smallest amount of virus needed to cause infection, so that's ID, infectious dose, or death, which is lethal dose, of 50% of exposed host cells or organisms. And, that, um, and then your results are expressed as ID50 or LD50. 
and then you can plot the data like this. So on the y-axis here, you have percent deaths. On the, in this particular case, your x-axis is dilution of virus. And so here, you know, at, 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 a, at no dilution of your virus, in this hypothetical example, you have 100% kill. At a 10 to the fifth dilution of your virus, you barely, you still get almost 100% kill. At a, you know, who knows, <laughs> something less than that, um, dilution of virus, you get a little less kill. But here you see a drop. Um, as, you know, you go from zero to a 10 to the minus six or a one to one million dilution, you get a drop to 50%. So 50% of your animals are killed when they're injected with this particular dilution. And so that becomes your LD50. And so then eventually, you know, you're, as, you, as you dilute the virus culture more, fewer and fewer of your animals um, die in your, test, in your test study.